Sarcopterygians are characterized by their fleshy, lobed fins that contain bones and muscles, enabling them to have greater control and movement compared to other fish groups, the fins are muscular and are supported by bony structures, and they are considered to be the closest living relatives of tetrapods. With rounded coronoid teeth, megamostax could have fed on hard-shelled animals. While low body sizes for Silurian vertebrates have traditionally been seen as a result of the Silurian having low levels of atmospheric oxygen, recent analyses have shown that terrestrial plant life was more well established in the Silurian than once thought, providing a previously unknown source of oxygen. Although it is not certain that megamostax's large size is a result of this atmospheric trend, the presence of such a large fish at this period does weaken the argument that a lack of large Silurian vertebrates can be used as evidence of low oxygen levels. Holopterygius was a fairly early member of the group, the only known fossil specimen was discovered in Germany in the 70s. Compared to its living relatives it was tiny just 7 cm long, with a distinctive tapering eel-like tail. Its convergent close resemblance to modern cuskiels suggest it may have occupied a similar ecological niche, living near the sea floor and hiding in tight spaces like crevices and burrows. Like other Sarcopterygians, Miguashia had lobed fins. These fins had a series of bones and muscles, allowing for more control and maneuverability compared to the fins of other fish. It had certain anatomical features that indicated adaptations for life in shallow waters or even brief excursions onto land. These adaptations included robust limb-like fins and specialized structures in the skull. Alanipterus is another genus of lobe-finned fish that is known to have lived in the waters of what would become Montana during the Carboniferous. It had a very deep body and reduced limbs, strongly suggesting that this fish was a slow swimmer and focused more towards maneuvering in slow-flowing or even still waters. Rebellatrix's most distinguishing feature was its tuna-like forked tail, which suggested a fast-swimming and active lifestyle, unlike coelacanth related to the living species. It may have reached 1.30 meters in length. In addition to its uniquely forked tail fin, the posterior dorsal fin is behind the anal fin rather than opposite it. It is believed to have been a fast-swimming predator, since its tail is clearly built for speed, and modern coelacanth only use the tail fin when attacking prey, and would have been one of the first non-sharks to fill this niche. Coelacanth have long been considered living fossils because modern representatives appeared similar to fossilized species from the Devonian period. However, with the discovery of numerous species, it has been found that they were much more diverse during the Paleozoic era than today, occupying a wide range of ecological niches in deep seas, lakes, and rivers. Furthermore, the genus Latimeria has only existed since the Cenozoic era, demonstrating that these animals have been continuously evolving until the present day. Like its close relative Mausonia, Axelrodicthes is a coelacanth with an elongated, low, and wide skull, whose skull roof and cheekbones are characterized by strong ornamentation. It differs from Mausonia mainly in its more elongated parietonasal shield, the development of the descending process of the supratemporal, and by the shape and arrangement of the cheek and lower jaw bones. Although tiny teeth are present on the palate and the inner part of the mandible, the mouths of these fish are mostly toothless. Mausonia is the amongst the largest of all coelacanth, it reached at least 3.5 meters in length, although one specimen possibly exceeded 5 meters rather than having teeth, the inside of the mouth was covered in small denticles. It was native to freshwater and brackish ecosystems. 
The diet of Mausonia and their mechanism of feeding is uncertain. It has been suggested that the denticles were used to crush hard-shelled organisms or that prey was swallowed whole using suction feeding. Foria's head was huge, and so that likely impacted its swimming style, though it is unclear how. Modern coelacanth moving very slowly through the water, moving their fins to help propel through. Since Foria reduced the size of its fins to an extent, it's possible that the tail was more vital in swimming, and the head may have been used to help steer. The bony shield may have also been helpful in protection from danger, which makes sense ans many predators were present in its environment. It probably would have spent a significant amount of time grazing, either on small crunchy invertebrates. Superficially, the Indonesian coelacanth appears to be the same as those found in the Comoros except that the background coloration of the skin is brownish-gray rather than bluish. They are typically found in deep-sea habitats, residing at depths of around 150 to 200 meters they inhabit underwater caves and rocky areas. Some individuals have been seen performing headstands as feeding behavior, allowing coelacanth to slurp prey from crevices within lava caves. This behavior is made possible due to the coelacanth's ability to move both its upper and lower jaw, which is a unique trait in extant vertebrates that have bone skeletons. Its population size is limited, and it faces threats such as habitat degradation, overfishing, and accidental capture in fishing nets. Coelacanth eyes are very sensitive, and have a tapetum lucidum. They are almost never caught in the daytime, but have been caught at all phases of the moon. Their eyes have many rods, receptors in the retina that help animals see in dim light. Together, the rods and tapetum help the fish see better in dark water. They are opportunistic feeders, hunting cuttlefish, squid and fish found in their deep reef habitats. Coelacanth are also known to swim head down, backwards, or belly up to locate their prey, presumably using their rostral glands. Scientists suspect that one reason this fish has been so successful is that specimens are able to slow down their metabolisms at will, sinking into the less inhabited depths and minimizing their nutritional requirements in a sort of hibernation mode. The skeleton of Lacognathus was structured such that large areas of the skin were stretched out over solid plates of bone. This bone was composed of particularly dense fibers, so dense that cutaneous respiration was not a likely trait exhibited by Lacognathus. Rather, the dense ossifications may have served to retain water inside the body as it traveled on land between bodies of water. Griffognathus was a specialized lungfish, about 60 centimeters long, with an elongated snout. The lower jaw and palate were lined with tooth-like denticles. Like all other lungfish, its skin was covered by overlapping scales, and it had an asymmetrical tail. Dipnorhynchus was a primitive lungfish, but still it had features that set it apart from other sarcopterygians. Its skull lacked the joint that divided the skull in two in Ripidists and Coelacanth. Instead, it was a solid bony structure similar to that of the first tetrapods. Instead of cheek teeth, Dipnorhynchus had tooth-like plates on the palate and lower jaw. Also, like land vertebrates, the palate was fused with the brain case. The Australian lungfish has several unique characteristics. It possesses both gills and a specialized lung-like organ, which allows it to breathe atmospheric air. This adaptation enables it to survive in oxygen-poor water or even out of water for short periods. It has a unique reproductive behavior. During the breeding season, males construct underwater nests and attract females by blowing bubbles and creating courtship displays. The female then deposits her eggs, and the male guards the nest until the young hatch. West African lungfish has a diet not unlike other lungfish, 
consisting of various mollusks, crabs and small fish within its distribution. It can also go for up to three years without any food intake whatsoever. During this time period it behaves much like an estivating fish in that it buries itself in the mud and does not move until more favorable conditions occur. Like other lungfish species, West African lungfish possesses both gills and a lung-like organ, it can extract oxygen from the air when water conditions are unfavorable or during periods of drought. It has the ability to undergo estivation, a dormant state, during periods of dry conditions. It burrows into the mud or builds a cocoon-like structure called a mucus sac to protect itself and reduce water loss until favorable conditions return. Osteolepus was about 20 centimeters long, and covered with large, square scales. The scales and plates on its head were covered in a thin layer of spongy, bony material called cosmine. This layer contained canals that were connected to sensory cells deeper in the skin. These canals ended in pores on the surface and were probably for sensing vibrations in the water. The most notable characteristics of Rhizidus were the two 20 cm fangs located near the front of its jaws, followed by other teeth scaling downwards in size. It was a giant apex predator that resided in freshwater river systems and large swamps. It fed on small to medium-sized amphibians, using its teeth to kill prey and rip it into digestible sizes, rather than swallowing prey whole like other, smaller toothed sarcopterygians, it has been suggested that it hunted like modern crocodiles. Fossil skin imprints show that Rhizidus had large, plate-like scales, similar to those found on modern-day Arapaima. Hyneria had powerful fins, but the popularized image of Hyneria using them to crawl across land is to date only speculation. It's likely that they would have been of more use while navigating shallow waters and submerged obstacles. In terms of being a predator, it would have been predators of other fish including sharks as well as temnospondyl amphibians. It had large sensory canals to aid in detection of possible prey, as the freshwater environment it inhabited likely was murky and had low visibility. Adult individuals retain juvenile features, suggesting that they were likely neotenic. Eusthenopteron had several anatomical features that make it significant in the study of tetrapod evolution. It had lobe-shaped pectoral and pelvic fins, which were likely used for both swimming and supporting itself in shallow water. Its fins had a series of bones that bear resemblance to the bones found in the limbs of early tetrapods. It exhibits characteristics of both fish and early tetrapods. While it retained fish-like traits such as gills and a long, streamlined body, it also possessed limb-like fins and a flexible neck. These features indicate a potential ability to support its body weight on land or in shallow water. As an intermediate in the fish tetrapod evolution, Pandorichthys had the capacity to breathe air. The trend from the early Sarcopterygians to the first tetrapods was an increase in the size of the spiracular chamber and its opening to the outside. Compared to Eusthenopteron, the spiracular chamber of Pandorichthys is greatly expanded and the hyomandibula is shorter compared to those in fish. The opercular series was also shorter compared to other osteolepiforms. One of the most notable features of Chick Talic is its limb-like appendages. Its front fins had a well-developed upper arm bone, a forearm-like structure with multiple rows of bones, and a rudimentary hand-like structure with articulated joints. This suggests a transitional stage between fins and limbs. It likely inhabited shallow freshwater environments with adaptations for both aquatic and terrestrial lifestyles, enabling it to navigate through shallow water and potentially venture onto land to find food or escape drying habitats. It was a carnivorous predator, it likely used its well-developed snout and sharp teeth to capture prey. 
The discovery of Chick Talik has had a significant impact on our understanding of vertebrate evolution and the colonization of land. It has helped bridge the gap between fish and tetrapods, shedding light on the evolutionary steps that led to the emergence of land-dwelling vertebrates. Unlike most other early tetrapods which have rounded or pointed snouts, Spathocephalus has a flattened, almost perfectly square-shaped skull up to 22 centimeters in both width and length. The squared shape is caused primarily by a widening of the paired nasal bones along the midline of the snout. Its jaws are lined with hundreds of small, chisel-shaped, closely spaced teeth. Its small chisel-shaped teeth would have been ill-suited for catching fish. Moreover, the flattened shape of its skull means that the depressor mandibuli, muscles that attach to the back of the skull and are responsible for opening the lower jaw, would not have had much room to anchor and therefore would have had poor mechanical advantage.